Hi there, I'm Simon St. Laurent. I'm a senior editor at O'Reilly Media Inc. and I'm a co-chair of next year's OSCON conference. I'm here with Francesco Cesarini. He's here to talk about Erlang. He's bringing us you know, beautiful concurrency, beautiful functional programming design patterns, and helping us get started as we, we make this trek. Hi, thanks so, for having me. <laughs> you're very welcome. Um, so as, we, as people come up to Erlang, what, what draws them and what's the, the way to get to those beautiful things? So what draws them is uh, the, the, C, uh, well, the search for uh, better tools, the search for uh, tools which increase their productivity within a certain domain of problems which you're trying to solve. And the domain of problems happens to be that of you know, massively concurrent uh, distributed systems. It could be anything from you know, embedded devices all the way up to supercomputers. But what brings them together is the fact that you know, these systems should never fail and yes. that they need to be able to scale both up and down. Right. Yeah. So there, there, there's a magic to that scaling. There's some discipline to getting to that magic. Sort of. And it's a, yeah, there is a discipline and it's a slightly different mindset when you're programming. It's a different approach. So instead of you know, taking the object-oriented programming approach, you would take uh, the concurrence-oriented concurrent -orient, programming approach, where instead of, you break up the problem into processes and into uh, truly concurrent events in, and actions in your system. So just to give an example, you know, if you were to write an instant messaging server in Erlang, uh, today you wouldn't have a process for every active session, for every user, mm -hmm. because that process becomes your bottleneck. Instead, you have a process for every message coming in or every message coming out, every status update, every login or logout requests. And so all of a sudden, 10 messages could be handled in parallel instead of you know, uh, serializing them right. through one single process. And, 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 and that's just, I think that's one of the hurdles to thinking you know, concurrently. Right. And if any of those messages goes wrong, Erlang will let you keep going. That's correct, because what you're doing through these processes, these processes won't share memory. So you're isolating your fault. And so if one of these processes terminates, okay, you lose a message. But in the grand scheme of things, uh, you've got a million messages going through your system. If there's a bug, you, know, you just want that message which is hit by that bug. You know, to go wrong and terminate. You want all the other uh, mm -hmm. messages to go through uninterrupted. Well, so Erlang offers a couple of layers of process management. There's the stuff that's built into the language, and you can definitely build so, a simple instant messaging system with that, but I don't think that's what you recommend as you go forward. No, that, that is correct. I mean, you've got several layers. Uh, the first layer is the process layer, which is on a virtual machine level. But you know, to build you know, massively scalable, truly concurrent systems, you need design patterns which you know, are reusable from one project to another. Your know, processes will behave in the same way, irrespective of them doing completely different things. And that's where a layer called OTP comes into the picture. And OTP provides behaviors for processes. So your process all of a sudden starts behaving like a finite state machine, like an event handler, mm -hmm. or like a you know, client server architecture. Or a third um, behavior, which is very typical for Erlang, and it's you know, been around in the Erlang world for a long time now, mm -hmm. which is called a supervisor. Its only job is you know, to supervise its children and make sure that nothing happens. And if something does happen, it takes you know, specific actions. And what you're doing that way is you're actually moving uh, the error handling from your workers to mm -hmm. a supervisor. And that you know, reduces your whole code amounts and you know, doesn't right. encourage defensive programming. Instead, you know, the error handling gets centralized and all the errors get handled uh, in, a, you know, in a similar fashion, centrally. Right. Well, it seems like there's a jump that a lot of people have to make to think concurrently. Um, you know, Erlang training sort of gets people up this series of plateaus. So, more than you know, think concurrently, they have to stop thinking in terms of objects, which I think is the biggest challenge. If an object-oriented language is what you've worked with for 10 years, mm -hmm. 15 years, or it's the first language you got taught, you know, it is one of the, uh, uh, you know, one of the computer science um, you know, families of languages. You know, the concurrence-oriented one is, is, is another. The functional is a third. And you need to be able to you know, swap in between these different families. And I think, you know, so that, that's, I think, is one of the biggest challenges. You need to stop thinking concurrently. Start thinking in terms of, you know, parallel things happening mm -hmm. at the same time, which, you know, it's a very natural way of thinking. 
but maybe not one you know you associate to computer science. Right, it's sort of the way we operate in the real world. Exactly. I but mean, when we look at computers, we expect a different set of constraints. Exactly. Exactly. Yes. So you and I are objects. We're not objects. Yeah, <laughs> we're we're parallel entities. So right. we're we're processes, and we're interacting right. via message passing, and we don't share memory. You know, I send the message yes. to you, you receive it, you process it, and then you send the message back to me. Right. And that's how we communicate. Right. And they've, what they've done is they've modeled this in a programming language. Right. Well, so for people who want to get started in this, it's, you know, there's, there were obviously sessions here, you did a workshop, uh, there was just a, I heard great things about the yeah. finite uh, state machine, state machine yeah. talk here earlier. Um, there's, so, yeah. I mean, there are a lot of online resources which I can warmly recommend, you know, before you even go out and buy the books. I mean, the first is uh, Learn You Some Airline. Yes, which it's, has the greatest illustrations. It's, 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 got, it's got some of the best illustrations, and you know, the book is available online. Yes. Um, you've got uh, lots of other free books, e-books available online. You've got airlinecentral.org, which is a community website which is, well, growing by the day, mm -hmm. which is just a repository for uh, you know, videos, for it's got the largest collection of tutorials, mm -hmm. uh, how-tos, and so on. And there are lots and lots of videos of presentations there as well, which are both you know, introductory as well as advanced, so I warmly recommend. There's the airline mailing list where you know, newbies who've shown that they've actually made an attempt to solve the problem are made to feel very welcome. And you've got the language inventors more often than not. You get answers from not. Joe Armstrong. Exactly, yes. Joe Armstrong and Robert Verding <laughs> will answer newbies yes. as well as experienced people alike. And I think that's just a reflection of the airline community, which is you know, just welcoming and... Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, very open. Excellent. Well, you're, you, you've done a book for O'Reilly on uh, airline programming. That's correct. And now you're working on a second volume. That yes, so we're, we're working on the follow-up to airline programming, which is designing for scalability with airline OTP. Mm -hmm. And we're basically taking where the last book, uh, where the last book left off. And uh, we're looking at you know, the first book, how do you, you know, was to learn airline and learn it in depth. Now we're actually describing how to implement massively scalable systems which should never fail. And so we're going through all of the OTP behaviors. When we've done that, we'll be looking at uh, you know, creating releases and how your, your typical uh, architectural patterns look like. Updating without stopping the system. Yes, your, your software upgrades during runtime your distributed uh, architectural patterns. And most important, you know, where you know, Erling, I think, has a big future is the scalability and multi-core. Where, you know, how do you get your Erling programs to, to scale and multi-core? What are the lessons, you know, we've learned so far? And what you need to keep in mind when you're actually designing your system? Right. It seems like you have distribution within the computer on multi-core, and then you have distribution to the larger... I mean, if you think of a machine, distribution is very much part of multi-core. Mm -hmm. um, because if you think of a machine with a million cores, yeah. there's no point in having a virtual machine running on a million cores. You're yeah. going to have multiple virtual machines. So right. yeah, we will soon you know, eventually reach probably the limit where you know, we're running a, a VM on a couple of thousand cores and there's no point in extracting it because of the bottlenecks and, right. uh, and well, the lock contention within the VM itself. Right. This is going to be exciting down. stuff as we it keep is, going. It is, it is, it is, yeah. Excellent. Great. Well, wonderful talking to you. Thank you for having Thank me. Thank you very much.